subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates the ascendant quran an advanced english translation of the meanings of the quran bismillah min ash-shaitan ar-rajim bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim alhamdulillah rabbil alamin والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا وخاتم الانبياء والمرسلين وعلى اله واهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واصحاب المنتجبين respected brothers sisters and youth and our guests and panelists assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh we are going to begin this uh, wonderful session webinar with a recitation from the noble quran and we are going to invite our brother uh, sheikh hasan rasul who is going to recite uh, some ayats for us before we proceed with the rest of our program inshallah so brother hasan sheikh hasan rasul if you could please uh, recite some ayats from the noble quran we'll be very grateful for your participation jazakumullah السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وسيق الذين اتقوا ربهم إلى الجنة زمرا حتى إذا جاءوها وفتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزانتها سلام عليكم طبتم سلام عليكم طبتم فادخلوها خالدين وقالوا Barakallahu Azim. Barakallahu Fikum, Brother 
uh, Hassan Rasul for that uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, heart rendering recitation. Uh, uh, may Allah bless and reward you amply for this. Uh, brothers, sisters, and youth in Islam, uh, we are truly honored to have all of you join us uh, in this webinar. Although we are going through a pandemic, uh, but there are uh, Allah's blessings in everything. While we pray for everybody's safety and good health, uh, we are blessed that we are in this glorious month of Ramadan. We will be embarking on the last 10 days of Ramadan. And at the same time, uh, we are meeting each other through the Zoom webinar. So while there are challenges of the pandemic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens other avenues for us to be able to meet brothers and sisters from all parts of the world through this new technology. We hope and pray that we will not have any glitches as we go through uh, our discussion with uh, Imam Muhammad al-Asi. But if there are, please bear with us. And we hope, inshallah, that these would be ironed out by our brothers uh, that are working on the technical side. This is truly a historic moment for us. As you, most of you are aware, uh, we in the Institute of Contemporary Islamic Thought uh, have been uh, honored to be able to have produced um, 14 volumes of the monumental tafsir the Ascendant Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture by Imam Muhammad al-Asi. And of course, he has been working on it for several decades. During the process, uh, we came to the realization that perhaps a translation was needed in order to serve as a gateway into the tafsir of the Noble Quran. And that is why uh, Imam Muhammad al-Asi uh, worked on this translation to be able to uh, assist our brothers and sisters in coming towards the tafsir with a better understanding and more keenness and more awareness. Now, this is historical in the sense that uh, this tafsir, uh, this translation that um, Imam Muhammad al-Asi has uh, produced is a contemporary translation. And inshallah, during our discussion, we will touch on uh, many of the aspects uh, that he has highlighted in this translation and its necessity and why uh, it would benefit uh, Muslims as well as open-minded non-Muslims who are willing to approach uh, the divine word of Allah uh, with uh, an open mind and a fair-mindedness. And we hope that this will benefit all of them. There are, of course, other um, projects as well underway that we will, inshallah, discuss uh, during the course of our discussion. So at this time, I'm uh, once again, uh, I will welcome everybody that has participated uh, in this Zoom webinar with us directly or those that are uh, with us through uh, live streaming uh, on Facebook. And inshallah, we hope that this will be uh, live streams through live streamed through many other channels, uh, but just as a sort of you know housekeeping chores, uh, let me add that um, uh, we are going to be asking uh, not questions of Imam Muhammad Al Asi, but indulging in more of a discussion with him so that uh, he can uh, elaborate on the, uh, the the translation that he has produced. And also those of our brothers and sisters that are on this Zoom webinar, they should be able to ask questions through the chat. And those who are on Facebook, they can actually send their questions through Facebook and they will be directed to us. And we hope to be able to incorporate, we hope that we can as many as possible. Just one quick reminder also that um, while the, the translation has, we just got word that the translation has uh, got back from the press today, but that has been uh, printed in South Africa. And it's going to take several weeks uh, before we get the copies here in North America. Uh, but in the meantime, I just want to show you a, a copy that we made. Basically, what we did was to 
I have the cover of uh, this translation printed and we wrapped it around an actual size copy that is going to be uh, available inshallah. So here is the actual sort of size of the, uh, of the translation. This is how it is going to look. Uh, of course, when you look at it in the camera, it is upside down because uh, the camera is going to see it the other way, but that's the front cover. Uh, that's the spine. That's how it's going to look. And that is the back of this um, uh, tra translation of the meanings of the Noble Quran. Uh, but this is the actual size, which is basically 10 inches by 7 inches, and it's 2 inches spine. So that's how it is going to be. And it's a complete volume with Arabic and English. And inshallah, we, we hope that our uh, brothers and sisters and youth would find it uh, beneficial in order to guide them towards understanding the divine words of Allah. Uh, having said that, um, I want to now proceed directly to um, uh, beginning with the questions uh, with uh, Imam Muhammad Al-Asi. Uh, and also that this question and answer session or discussion session would last about an hour and 15 minutes. And then we would have uh, our other brothers and sisters that may have sent questions so that we can uh, put them to uh, Imam Muhammad al asim So once again, uh, everybody, uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, Brother Muhammad, let me start off uh, directly with you. And this is a question that many uh, people have asked. Uh, they say that, uh, why another translation when we already have so many other Eng English translations available? So perhaps you might want to address that. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وخاتم النبيين البشير النذير السراج المنير وعلى آله وصحبه ومن سار على هداه uh, It's a uh, it's a great opportunity to be with you today, those of you who are tuned in, to explain uh, almost a lifetime of uh, innocent ambition to have the meanings of the Quran translated so that as much as we can, uh, communicate these meanings without the uh, odd words or the uh, Shakespearean language or the Judeo-Christian terminologies and these other things. Like Brother Zafar mentioned, there are quite a few translations available. And we're talking, of course, <laughs> It's the Arabic origin, that's the Qur'an, inna anzalnahu Qur'anan Arabiya. Verily, we have made this Qur'an accessible as an Arabic Qur'an. Now, I know some people, they get goosebumps uh, sometimes when uh, the word Arab or Arabic is used. Uh, obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he revealed this Qur'an in the Arabic language, he did not reveal it to give any particular group of people any nationalistic or any ethnic superiority. So anyone who feels sensitivity or allergy to the word Arab or Arabic, uh, they should adjust that type of thinking. Uh, so this Quran, now we're speaking about its translation from the original Arabic text into the English language. Now I can't speak about translations because I know there's also plenty of translations of the ayat of the Quran, uh, their meanings into other languages. But a general, I think, impression is that there are the same uh, type of setbacks that in other languages that are similar to the setbacks of the English language when we translate the meanings from Arabic into English. I've, uh, I've 
gone through uh, some of these translations in English. And many years ago, I'm going back uh, maybe 40, 50 years ago, when I first began uh, reading the English translations, I realized that if I was a, only an English speaking person, I knew nothing of Arabic. I'm reading here this English text. And then <clears throat> I'd say to myself, I don't know if this is that interesting. There may be some, obviously, because some translators, they really do a, an outstanding effort in translating some of the ayat of the Qur'an. But many other ayat in the Qur'an, in the process of translation, that pristine quality that is present in the original text, it just doesn't, it, it, the communication process cuts off. It cuts off because of uh, uh, at least a few things. One of them is archaic language. Many of these translations, they have, uh, maybe I can later on give you a, a, an example and a comparison between the translation that yours truly uh, uh, accomplished and the other translations. And you can get a feel for the usage of what you may call outdated language, because some of these words like uh, words you'll find in some of these translations, thou and thee and thine and lo and there, there's so alhamdulillah, this translation has been uh, purged of what you may call Shakespearean language or ancient English or these things. So that that is one contribution that will help because translation is an attempt to lift the meanings from the original language into the language uh, into which the text is translated. Another issue that is of concern is not only the choice of word, but the style. There's uh, biblical terminology, and many of our English translations, they are top heavy with the Judeo-Christian vocabulary. So, uh, and I'll give you an example here. I don't want, you know, just to be speaking generalities. We have certain words in the Quran that are key words. It's necessary to understand these words to unlock other meanings pertaining to them. You take the word, uh, as an example, you take the word kafir. The word kafir is, is depending on the, the translation that you are reading, it's translated as either an unbeliever or a disbeliever or an atheist, or a sometimes polytheist, uh, or a heathen, and so forth and so on. It, it's these types of words that when, when you use your daily language, how many times you can look at the past year, listen to people speaking the English language, when was the last time you heard in the day-to-day -day conversation someone saying, oh, I just had a conversation with a heathen? It, it just doesn't exist. So that word, it, it, just by choosing to use that type of word, you have uh, the translator, and I appreciate, I'm not trying to knock down the translators. I'm sure in their own capacity, they tried their utmost best to deliver these meanings from English to Arabic. I, I have no doubts about that, most of these translators. Now, there are other types of translators who are Orientalists, and they'd love to use these 
types of words that will disconnect the reader of the Quran from the message or the meanings of the ayat. So in this, the translation, uh, the Ascendant Quran translation, you will not find these types of biblical choices of words. We tried our best uh, to cleanse the language and make it, because the Quran is a functional book. It's not, when, when someone reads the Quran, we're, we're not reading uh, lullaby chapters. We are not reading, uh, you know, chronicles of history. What we are reading is information that is infused into our daily lives. The Quran comes alive when the, its meanings become functional. And this is the dimension, more or less, this is the dimension that is absent from the translations that we have. So this effort, if, if we wanted to, to put it in a few words, this effort of the, the translation, the Ascendant Quran translation, is making the Quran communicative with the reader. So they, you say, oh, now I understand what this ayah means, or now I understand what this short surah means. It, it's it, the, the fogginess that existed because of, only because of language itself, we try to dissipate it as much as is humanly possible. I have to mention here that when we're speaking about the translation of the ayat of the Quran, in a more accurate way, we should say the translation of what is understood of the meanings of the Quran. Because the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his words are so fertile that there is a gen there's a generative process of meanings that occur when when operating minds are in contact and in touch with these ayat in the quran so to be conscious of this effort we say that we are translating what we understand to be the meaning or the meanings of this ayah or this surah. So this is your humble brother's understanding of these ayat. And I, I, should, I should also say here, I don't, I don't know if I'm preempting another question, but I should also say here that this effort, uh, this uh, first copy uh, that Brother Zafar mentioned has just been completed today, meaning it's off the press today and ready to to go out into the, to the whoever you know wants to have a copy. Uh, this is, I think, it came out to about one thousand one hundred and thirty pages, or in that area. And this translation has the the page of it has Arabic on one side uh, of the page, and then uh, corresponding to the ayah on the Arabic side of the page will be the English uh, translation of that ayah. So it's going to be Arabic and English, and it's going to amount to, as I said, 1130 odd pages. Now, there is uh, um, an effort to have another uh, copy of this translation meant for those who are not uh, very well versed uh, with, uh, let's say, Islamic terminology. So in that edition, we will have 
the Arabic omitted from the pages and just have the, the English uh, with, here we are <coughs> more or less conceding uh, a little just for the purpose of teaching or communicating, we will have the, the anglicized words introduced into the translation. And what that means is if an, an average person who is in the English-speaking world, a non-Muslim, what is, is curious because in our world today, there's a lot of question marks about Islam. There's a lot of curiosity about the Quran. And there's a lot of um, question marks about the Prophet and these things. And the average person is bombarded uh, 24-7 with misinformation and out and out lies about Islam and the Quran and the Prophet. So they are victimized. The average person, I'm speaking about the average person who's out there in the field or out there in the factory or wherever, and he hears all of this stuff about Islam and he wants to say, okay, well, let me get to the bottom of this. If a person really wants to understand Islam, they say, well, let's go to the, the holy book that these Muslims have. So if we give, if we make available for this average person, let's say um, a college level translation of the Quran, well, this person may have not graduated from college and he may not be familiar with some words. So we have to make it easier for that person to understand these ayat. So in this sense, we sacrifice and I'll give you the example. Instead of saying Isa, you know, if we translated or transliterated the word Isa into English, of course, a Muslim would know who Isa is. But a non-Muslim would say, what's, he'll see the word I-S-A with the necessary diacritics. And say, I mean, this is becoming difficult for me to follow. So we don't want to put a word obstacle in his way. So we make it easier for him and we'll say Jesus because it's in reference to the same person. And the same thing with Musa, we'll say Moses. The same thing with Elias, we'll say Elijah and so forth and so on. So that this person now can at least say to himself, Oh, I can follow. I can read and follow what's being said here. There's no wording obstacle. And then maybe if Allah gives us enough effort and enough patience and endurance, um, somewhere down the road, months from now or a year from now or however long it may take, we may have another more simplified translation of the Qur'an, you may call it a translation for juniors. Our youthful generation who are still in high school or some of our uh, brothers and sisters in Islam or in humanity who didn't get the opportunity to go to school and are not familiar with refined words. Because if anyone is involved with a translation effort, they would understand that they are entering a jungle of synonyms. It's a jungle out there in the world of literature and words. And the, Qur the Quranic words, they have a, um, they have a, a tune up to them. A Quranic word that is mentioned dozens of times or even hundreds of times in the Quran, the, the tune-up, the finessing of a particular word is done by the context that that word is in. So you can't take one word in the Quran, let's say the word Nasara, which 
generally is translated as Christians. You can't take that one word and every time you see it in the Quran, you automatically translate it as Christian. And this, unfortunately and regrettably, this is what has happened to many translators. They took one word and they used it consistently wherever it occurs in the Quran and it occurs in different contexts with different uh, variables at work and so it, it has to be uh, it has to be delivered in English with its present day equivalent because we are living in a particular time that has uh, idioms to it and now as is the case with you know, languages, uh, some of the words that we choose for our translation today in a thousand years from now, because of the development of societies and because of the, uh, of the progress in the human condition and because of the shifting of the usage of words throughout time, then there's going to have to be a crew of people just like us today who put our minds together and translate the meanings of the ayat of the Qur'an into the um, mainstream terminology of the people of that time. And uh, that's why we need, we, uh, I'm not, I don't mean we, the Muslims only, we, the humans, the human occupants of the world, we need a communicative translation of the meanings of the ayat of the Qur'an. And we hope and we pray that this translation, the Ascendant Qur'an translation, will serve that purpose and you will not be, any reader of it, will not be alienated from at least the gist of the meaning of the ayah when reading this translation. If we, ha if we can accomplish that, then it's mission accomplished. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us the a, what we hope, we think, is a significant contribution to the literature of translating the meanings of the guiding Qur'an. Jazakumullah uh, khair, Brother Muhammad, for this very elaborate uh, explanation. And as uh, you were speaking, uh, of course, you know, the, the brothers and sisters participating in, in this um, webinar have been asking questions. So I'm going to basically, some of the questions you have actually already answered, you have addressed them, but I'm going to go in and uh, sort of, you know, zoom in on specific aspects. So for instance, in uh, this uh, translation that uh, alhamdulillah you have completed you have a, a couple of things that that are sort of you know that come into it for instance uh, you have avoided footnotes or um, commentary etc uh, of or explanatory notes number one secondly um, some of the things that you insist for instance you do not want to translate the word allah as god so i think maybe you can sort of you know uh, touch on that briefly and, and of course, there are a lot of other questions coming. We have a whole list of questions as well, but I thought I'll bring this up so that, you know, you can uh, guide us through this. Yes, thank you very much. These are, uh, are very important questions. First of all, the method that is being used in this translation, the Ascendant Quran, the method is unique. Um, there, there hasn't been any other translation that I'm aware of that has used the explanation of the ayah within brackets inside the ayah. Many translators, they know because they are familiar with the Arabic text and they know that the Arabic text needs further clarification to make, to have the reader understand the scope of the meaning. So what they do is they either footnote the ayah in most of the cases, or they may endnote the ayah so that a person 
can get more range of the meaning of the ayah. And that's necessary. And in their own way, they, they were trying to help out the reader by footnoting or endnoting the, the necessary explanations to understand the meanings of the ayah. But what yours truly did was instead of putting footnotes, because I'm a reader also, I'm just like everyone else. So if I go to a book and I'm reading and I see that, you know, okay, there's a note here. So I have to look down or turn the page or go to the end of the Quran or the end of the book to see what else is, what else the writer has provided of explanatory information. That process of moving my eyes to the bottom of the page or turning the page or turning the whole book around to the end of the book, that sort of disconnects me a little from my flow. So to avoid this disconnection, what is done in this translation is instead of having these footnotes, there are a few footnotes. It's not like this translation does not have any footnotes at all. No, there are, but they're kept to a very minimum. And so instead of having a footnote, we open brackets inside the area and we put the, the filler meaning that is, that is embedded in the area, we place it between those two brackets. So that way a reader, when he, he or she is reading, they just keep on reading and they don't have to fo focus on another page and then refocus back on the original page that they were on. So we, we think and we, we pray that this will help the Quranic reader in as far as keeping keeping track of the idea or the developing meaning without being interrupted with you know going somewhere else to and then coming back the other uh, question that you raised concerning uh, the word lafzul uh, jalala the uh, the expression of majesty allah's name allah's name in other words is referred to the expression or the utterance of his majesty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, the, the best way to understand this is uh, the word that designates a deity uh, or an authority in, in different languages has a either a religious or a cultural uh, content to it. So because we're speaking English, I mean, this applies to all languages, by the way, it doesn't only apply to English. There are other languages that use other words to refer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that word that is used in these languages, it has a connotation to it that violates the unity or the tawheed of Allah. Let's say we are speaking English. This is the language we speak. And as I said, this applies to other languages, but I, this is not the time to go into that. When, we, when someone is using the word, you're speaking to an, an English speaker. He may, be, uh, he may be an atheist. He may be a Christian. He may be a Jew. He, whoever he is or she is. You're speaking to this individual and you use the word God. In their mind, automatically, most of the people are of the Christian religion around. So automatically, God in their mind uh, triggers a concept of the Trinity. Uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Or whatever other uh, definitions they may have to God, which is not a Tawhidi definition. It is not a definition of Allah's combined divinity and authority, as is the concept of the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another way of understanding this, the word Allah is a proper noun, just like you have a proper noun, I have a proper noun, 
uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a proper noun. And this proper noun has one word to it, and that word is Allah. So when, when we are using the word Allah in this uh, 1130 plus page translation, we are we, we specifically mean to have the reader and I uh, I feel confident Allahu alam Allah knows the best that most of the readers are going to be Muslims. So we're not you know cutting anyone off by using this. but in the in the addition that is meant for non-Muslims, as I said before, we have to sacrifice or we have to we have to step down a little and instead of using the word Allah throughout that particular translation and only for purposes of communication and trying to to penetrate the mind and the heart of the reader the word god is used but with the uh, with the ambition that the person who is reading this, who is not of the Islamic faith, that person who is reading that will gain. We're not, we're not putting an obstacle in his or her way. So the person will gain the understanding of Tawheed by using the word God as a step stone or as, uh, as a, as a, step forward at graduating from God and then using the word Allah. So uh, I think uh, that explains why we use the word Allah and not use the word, another word in another language, in this case, the word God in the English language. And by the way, there's other words for God, even in the English language. So, um, uh, Hopefully, it'll be an educating process for all involved, inshallah. Jazakallah uh, khair, brother Muhammad. Um, I want to get into specific examples uh, in uh, the translation as well as in the tafsir that, that you've been working on. One aspect that I personally, of course, was struck by, this ayat in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu. Every English translation that I have come across says, O oh, you who believe. But you have moved away from this. You have, in fact, given a, um, a very beautiful explanation of this ayat. Uh, I want you to please uh, elaborate on this as well as the related aspect uh, in, in your particular tafsir and the translation that you have done. Um, you also emphasize repeatedly on Allah's power and authority. So please elaborate on both of them, the, the, the ayah or the part of the ayah, Ya Ayyuhal Lazina Amanu, and the importance of recognizing Allah's power and authority that regrettably is not uh, highlighted properly in other translations. Excellent questions. And this goes to the heart of the matter. And this is what distinguishes this translation from the others and hopefully in a very positive and complementary way, not in any confrontational or antagonistic way. <clears throat> it, as I said in the, in the initial remark that I'm, in the first remark that I made, the translations are, that we have in the English language, they are full of terminology that belongs to biblical literature. Unfortunately, we, the Muslims, have not taken control of the non-Arabic language, in this case, English. We have not taken control of the language and then molded words or even invented words. This is what has to be done. You know, languages, they have the capacity to... Um, absorb new words. You'll find in the English language, there's Latin words, there's French words, there's German words. All of these have been absorbed into uh, these languages. We, the Muslims, have not had any contribution uh, in 
we ourselves introducing some of our own terminology into the English language. There are some Islamic words in the English language, but they came into the English language not because we, the Muslims, propelled them into the language. It's because some Orientalist or some academic or some uh, politician or whoever thought, okay, let's use this word in the English language. One of these words is kafir, or it's mispronounced in, I guess, some areas in Africa. They say kafir or something like that. So they give it their own twist. They bring it into the language. They give it their own twist. And then uh, we are supposed to be, con- we the Muslims who are supposed to know better, we become consumers of their words and their words are second fiddle to their thoughts and their thoughts are in the service of their imperialism and their Zionism. So we are actually, when by the choice of our words, we are liberating ourselves from their their dictionary definitions of certain words. And this is where we, we come to Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, if you follow this word in the Quran, in the over, uh, this phrase, if you follow it in the Quran, in the overwhelming majority of cases, there is a responsibility or an assignment that follows that. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. We're in Ramadan right now. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Kutiba alaykum usiyamu kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Kunu qawamina bil qist. Shuhada alillah. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Kutiba alaykum ul qital. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Ku anfusakum. Ya Every sentence that follows Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu carries with it a responsibility and a task when when someone is translating Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu as O you who believe someone who believes does not necessarily that does not necessarily translate to a deed or an action I can believe in something but that doesn't mean I have to do that type of thing. But when Allah is saying, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, he is, he is coupling that with a following effort that we are supposed to, if it's an obedience, if, if it's something to do, we will do it. If it's something to avoid, we will avoid it. And the word mu'minin or al-ladhina amanu, this word is taken from an ayah in the Quran, the understanding of this word and its translation into English is taken from an ayah in the Quran, I think it's ayah number 82 in Surah Al-An'am, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِيمَانَهُمْ بِظُلْمٍ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمْنِ وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ So Allah is right now giving us the definition of الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا They are the ones who have not contaminated their commitment to Allah with zulm, with injustice, wrongdoing, or oppression. In the ayah, they are the one ones who secure Allah's safety. And they are the ones who are guided. So we have the word security that defines الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And then we go to the Prophet, there's a hadith by Allah's Prophet. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his. In this hadith, the Prophet says, 
لا إيمان لمن لا أمانة له A person who cannot be trusted does not have Iman. So if you combine the word trust and you combine the word security, you come, you come out with the, with the expression in the English language, oh, you who are firmly or securely committed to Allah, or in short, oh, you who are committed to Allah. This element of commitment dovetails with, and I'm not trying to here justify it, but just for your information, it dovetails with the original word that was used in pre-Islamic scriptural history. The prophets of the Abrahamic prophets, they use the word covenant. I chose not to use the word covenant, rather to use the word commitment, even though they are very similar in their scriptural and practical meanings. But because of our history, our meaning, our Islamic history with people of scripture, we extended our hand to them and they more or less slacked our extended hand. So they didn't want to have any commonality or any common grounds between us and them. Okay, fine. You have your way and we'll have our way. You have your choice of words. We will have our choice of words. Lakum dinukum waliyadin. So that had that that has to do with why we use the word oh you who are committed to Allah and not the word oh you who believe. I'm sorry, Brother Zafar, what was the second question about? Second question was with respect to Allah's power and authority. Uh, yes. You have highlighted in both in your tafsir as well as in this translation. Excellent question. It's so excellent that uh, it skipped my mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has Asma'ullahi al-Husna wa lillahi al-Asma'ul Husna. These are around 100 descriptions and attributes of Allah Jalla Jalaluh. And when you look at these attributes, the gracious, the most merciful, the compassionate, the all-knowing, the all-hearing, the all-seeing, the subtle, the, the most endearing, etc., etc. All of these attributes of Allah you can encounter an average Muslim and you can encounter an average non-Muslim in their own understanding or in their own definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't argue with you. No one, no one takes issue with this. Everyone succumbs to it. They say, yes, God is oft forgiving. God is nearer to us than anything else. And so all of these attributes there's no quibble about. There, but when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his uh, attribute as al-adl, the just, Allah's attribute as al-qawi, al-qadir, al-muqtadir, Allah's attribute as al-hakim. There are these attributes that specifically give us the unmistakable meaning that Allah has immediate authority and he has prevailing power. These are meanings that are omitted from our understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In many cases, this factors in very significantly when we are speaking about power and wealth. Power and wealth have become deities unto themselves. Whoever has power in this world, I'm speaking about, I'm not speaking about 
in an Islamic construct of life. I'm speaking about in the crass materialistic world that we, you and I and everyone else shares today, here and now. Those who have power, military power, soft power, whatever type of power you want to refer to it, those who have this type of power, even though they don't say that they are gods, but just because they wield the power the way they do, they are playing the role of gods in our lives. They don't tell you and me, I'm a god. Has anyone heard of uh, a certain president or king or military general or has anyone heard of any of them come and say, but I'm God. It's the God that you are worshiping up there in heaven. Well, you know, uh, you have the freedom to entertain your own mythologies and your own superstitions. That's you're right. But, you know, I'm your God. No one says that. It's not what they say, it's what they do that counts. They act like gods, and therefore, by acting as gods, they are display, or they are trying to displace Allah Azza wa Jal from our conscience, from our minds, from our emotions, from our daily life. Allah has been for, for, for practical purposes, Allah cannot, you, you cannot marginalize Allah. But in the materialistic world that people are, are beholden to, in that materialistic world, these have become the gods. So this also enhances our understanding of our own shahada our article of faith as it is called when we say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan rasulullah when we profess when we confess to this meaning that means we are prioritizing allah's power and allah's authority in our life in everything that we do but we don't this this attribute of allah is absent why because for all practical reasons and purposes we have been secularized even though you know many of us we perform our rituals i mean some of us we pray five times a day we pray our Voluntary uh, nawafil during the night, we fast Ramadan, we fast extra days during the year on a Monday and on a Thursday and on Ayam al Tashriq, the mid uh, lunar, the mid days of the lunar month. And we do all of this, you know, we pay the 2.5% zakah and we go to Hajj and everything, you know. But when it comes to Allah's authority, when it comes to Allah's power, He's absent. He, he's not absent in the real sense of the word. He's absent in our conceptual uh, sense of the word. No one factors in Allah as, let's say, you're a husband in your family. And a husband is the power center of the family because of, you know, physical stuff and because of responsibilities in this. So let's take a husband here. We're not going to deal right now at this moment, even though in the tafsir of the Ascendant Quran, the tafsir, we, we dwell on this at length. But to simplify it, instead of going out into a very complex world with politics and ideology and philosophies and militaries and economies, okay, We'll, we'll, we'll simplify it. Just come to the family. In the family, when a husband or a father, when they use their power to subdue their wife or their children, they do that with the absence of Allah. They did not factor into their conscience, their mind, and their heart that Allah's power is Right here and now, 
Allah's authority is going to take its course. So I better be careful as a husband and a wife, I mean, as a husband and a father, I have to be careful with the relative, it's only relative, with the relative power that I have. If I am conscious that Allah lives in me, lives with me, lives inside of my heart, inside of my muscles, inside of my brain, inside of my action, if I am aware of that, then I'll think twice before I abuse power. Now, if this applies on, a, on the scale of a family, it also applies on the scale of humanity. And if we can adjust this, if we can, that's why some people, and I, I've received this comment from some very concerned and very sincere readers and followers of the Ascendant Quran, it, the tafsir there. And they say, well, I mean, isn't it obvious that Allah is an authority and a power? I said, in the abstract world, yeah, it's obvious. No one, you know, is going to, in their right mind, I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule, but no one's going to argue that because one of the attributes, and it's used even in, in biblical language, almighty, the almighty, almighty God. That, but they say that, but when it comes to the real world, almighty Allah, almighty God is not there because they keep on doing what they do. Why do the people who are uh, uh, killing, the people right now who are running and controlling and uh, deconstructing, I dare say, destroying Mecca and Al Medina, these people, they went to war with the poorest people in the world, in Yemen. Did they do that when Allah, his power presence is in their mind and his authority is in their mind? Did they do that? Can someone do that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is circulating in their thoughts? It can't be done. So this absent reality has to become stark, uh, obvious for those who are reading the meanings of these ayat. So Allah Jalla Sha'nuhu, uh, elevated is his affair. Allah Jalla Sha'nuhu has to be reconscientized, if I can use that construct. He has to be reconscientized in us. He can't remain this abstract, you know. Oh, Allah is, you know. Yeah, yeah. We you know, don't don't read. This is the, this is the refrain. You, oh, you don't have to remind me of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know He's the authority and He's the most powerful. No, okay. If you know that, then why are you abusing the power that you have? Don't you know that this power is Allah's power? They don't know these things. Why do you promulgate laws contradictory? to Allah's moral laws. We, we have our understanding of Allah and his prophet is we are moralizing our laws and we are legalizing our morality. And this can only be done when we acquiesce to Allah's immediate authority and his preponderance of power. And that's why you will you will see this repeated many times. It's not meant just to fill in words or to expand a sentence or anything like that. It is meant for us to honor Allah in His quintessence of attributes, and that His that is His power and His authority here on earth as it is in heaven. Um. I want to touch on one other word or expression uh, in the Quran whose meaning uh, in other translations actually deeply troubled me, but I had really no way of sort of, you know, because I'm not Arabic speaking. And that word is the word Ummi or the plural Ummiyun. And referring to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the community in which he was raised, you know, in Surah Al-Jum'ah, for instance, some translations 
refer to that as illiterate. Others said, well, slightly better unlettered, others untutored. But you have given a very different translation or meaning of this word ummi as well as ummiyun. Could you please highlight that and explain that? Yes, and that's also a very good question. And I, I would just like to remind those who are tuned in that um, uh, yours faithfully uh, has been working on trying my best to give the meanings of the Quranic words their contextual uh, definition. The word ummi, uh, this, uh, this is a weekly series that I, I try to dwell on this specific aspect of the Qur'an. The Qur'an, mashallah, there's many fields in the Qur'an that you can pursue. Lingu a, a, a linguistic explanation of things, and then there is a fiqhi explanation of things, and then there is a philosophical, and it's just a, it's a, it's a, an unending effort of the mind. So we go back to your question, uh, Brother Zafar, about uh, ummi. Ummi does mean illiterate. It does mean that. I mean, whoever translated the word ummi as illiterate or unlettered or untutored, they are not. They are not inventing a, a translation. They are not uh, one hundred percent wrong because that word does have that meaning, and. If if you dig deep down in in some of the uh, linguistic discourses, the simple meaning of ummi is someone who belongs. Um um means mother. I mean, I, I I'm sure many uh, of the uh, those uh, who are listening, uh, they know that um means mother. So ummi, the word ummi means belonging to mother or mothery i mean the, the english because the english language is inflexible like the arabic language is you, there's no word in english that you can say oh he's mothery it's, it doesn't it doesn't exist but in arabic it does exist it's ummi his mother now who's mothery who's who belongs to his mother it's a baby a baby belongs to its mother and a baby doesn't understand anything. So that is the genesis of illiteracy or lack of knowledge. It's that babyhood. They don't know nothing. They know nothing. They're very innocent, but they know nothing. That's an ummi. Now, this word, like other words in the Quran, is fine-tuned by the context that it is in. So we take the word ummi, let, let's say in Surah Al-Jumu'ah, there's an ayah that says, هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ This ayah, just an example, just a sample of uh, explaining uh, the word ummi in context. It says, huwa, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who sent to the ummiyin, the motherlies, if, if we want to go back to the, the origin of the, the linguistic genesis of the word, rasulan minhum a prophet, a messenger from among them. Yetlu alayhim ayate. He puts into a functional order Allah's ayat. Wayuallimuhumul kitaba wal hikmah. And he teaches them scripture and wisdom. Wa in kanu min qablu lafi mubin, even though in times before they were in manifest uh, waywardness. Now, the Arabians, I make a distinction. This is a time to explain this part too. I make a distinction between those who are Arabs 
and those who are Arabians. Those who speak the Arabic language before Islam are Arabians. Those who speak the Arabic language and break with Islam are Arabians. Those who speak the Arabic language and are not Muslims are Arabians. So Allah sent to these Arabians. Now, who are these Arabians? These Arabians, if there's anything in the world that they were skilled at, that they had outstanding... Remember, this is primitive society in the Arabian Peninsula over 1400 years ago and for the centuries before that. They were, you know, they had a few urban centers. They had Sana'a, they had Mecca, they had a couple of other places, Yathrib. And now, the, for the rest of it, they were nomads, shifting from one area to the next, seeking one oasis after the other, looking for some pastures for their sheep and for their flocks. So, in the, in the material world, these were very elementary people. But in the world of language, they were the most developed. If there's anything they took pride in, it was their language. They finessed a language, unlike the civilizations of Persia and Egypt and Greece and the Romans and the uh, Hindus and the uh, Chinese and the, the Orient and the Mayas and the Americas and all this. There's the, these, these were modernities of their times that had uh, milestones of, civili of uh, materialistic civilizations. You had the pyramids, you had the hanging gardens, you had the amphitheaters, you had... What did these Arabians have? They had tents, they had camels, they had mud houses, they had few structures here and there. But what they had was the most eloquent language that humanity may possess. That's what they had. So if, if Allah is speaking about ummiyin, illiterate, then they, they, they'd probably have no language. There are societies and peoples in the world that basically don't have a language. You can call those ummiyin in the, in the literal sense of the word. But you can't call a people who had reached the apex of linguistic finesse, you can't call them ummiyin. So what, in this context, what does ummi mean? Ummi means scriptureless people. These Arabians did not have a scripture. They didn't have a Torah. They didn't have an Injid, even though there were Arabic speaking communities in the Arabian Peninsula who had uh, become Jews or Christians. But the overwhelming majority of that Arabian society did not have scripture. This is what this is what this is why it's important to understand words in their context. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions an nabi al-ummi, the ummi prophet, he is mentioning a nabi that belongs to people who did not have a scripture, scriptureless people. That doesn't mean that they were uh, subnormal in their uh, mental development. It doesn't mean that they were illiterate. So what it, it simply means, you know, it, they didn't have a scripture. Scriptureless people, a prophet for scriptureless people. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored them by having this Quran revealed to the prophet. Now they were honored twice by Allah's immaculate book and by Allah's immaculate prophet. They were honored with this, and that was the turning point from their from 
from there onwards, they are no longer ummiyin as they were before. So that's the point I think that also distinguishes uh, a little more effort in understanding the, the words of the Qur'an uh, and making it understood for those who are reading it. Uh, now I'm going to, uh, Brother Muhammad, I'm going to turn to a question that one of our brothers uh, has sent to us. There are actually a lot of questions, but I'm, you know, there are so many questions that we have already prepared and obviously we won't be able to go through them. Perhaps we will probably have to have another session or a Zoom webinar. But here is a question that uh, a brother has raised. Uh, he says that, uh, for instance, in the Quran, expressions like uh, Bani Israel or Banu Israel, Bani Yaqub, Yahud, and Anasara are used. How do these relate to the expression Ahlul Kitab? You know, it's uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm giving a general answer here. There's much details for, the, for this type. And I hope anyone who's interested in these types of differentiations and these types of nuances would tune into the, the weekly presentation in which I try to complement the tafsir and the translation with uh, in-depth uh, analyses of phraseologies and words. So the... Uh, in the in the ayat of the Quran, we find the words Ahl al Kitab. Uh, Ahl al Kitab means uh, folks belonging to Scripture, uh, people of the book, people of Scripture, and that is a. Um, it's like saying, "I'm extending my hand to you." Uh, it's it's a favorable expression. It's like tapping on the nice side because uh, those belonging to Scripture, whether they are Jews or Christians or others who belong to Scripture, even though the Scriptures that they have have been very distorted by them, not because of the original revelation, but because of the generations that came afterwards and distorted those Scriptures. So when we say, yeah, let's take a couple of ayat in the Quran that say, Ya Ahl al-Kitab. One of them is, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum. Come to a common ground or a common word between us and you. Allah na'abuda illallah wa la nushrik, et cetera, et cetera. So you can sense here that he, we are extending our hand for some type of understanding between uh, the committed Muslims on one side and those who are hanging on to their understanding of scripture, even though they, they have changed a lot in, that con, uh, content, in those contents. So it's, a, it li it's a, like a, a friendly remark or phrase that we are approaching them with. We're not hostile to people of, 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 of faith, to people of morality, to people of higher divine standards. Muslims are all inclusive of these types, accommodating uh, of, of that type of uh, mindset and psychology. But then on the other hand, because those who say that they are Christians and those who say that they are Jews, we're not speaking about others because there are others who may be included in this aspect. But those who say that they are Christians, they say that they are Jews, they also show a very hostile attitude towards the Muslims. This is a historical fact. Anyone wants to review history will see that wars have broken out between committed Muslims and those who say that they are Christians or Jews. And it is true in today's world. You can see. You can see how the Muslims practically all over the world have been victimized by warfare. And I mean, this thing, uh, you know, if anyone who reads Crescent International can get a very good feeling of the position the Muslims are in the world today. So uh, being that they have this dual psychology in them, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this Qur'an is guidance to us. He didn't say that all of them are moral people, and he didn't say all of them are satanic. There's an element of goodness there, which we should identify and approach accordingly. And there's an element of evil in them, which we should identify and expose and be ready for it. So when that is the case, you will find uh, such ayat in the Quran as, and this is just an example, there's more than, more than you and I would like. Uh, there's an ayah says, Ya Bani Is Lu'ina Ladina Kafaru Mim Bani Israel. Condemned are those who are in denial. And here between brackets of Allah's power and authority. Lu'ina Aladina Kafaru Mim Bani Israel. Those who are in denial of Allah's power and authority who belong to Bani Israel, are condemned. By the words of Prophet Dawood and Isa, the, Jesus, the son of Maryam. That condemnation is due to them because of their disobedience of Allah and because of their aggression. So when they violate Allah's authority and they challenge Allah's power, they do that because they marginalize Allah. Once again, we go back to that initial question. Why do we encounter the word Allah's power and authority? Allah's present and preponderant power. Allah's immediate and overwhelming authority. These words have to be understood in real time when we are uh, looking at uh, these segments of uh, those who say that they are followers of the Torah or those who say that they are followers of the gospel. Uh, and Allah did not leave us in the dark. He showed us their good side, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, and he showed us their bad side. Bani Israel, latajidanna ashadda nasi adawatan lilladhina amanu al-Yahuda wal-ladhina ashraku. Those in the, uh, you will find, this ayah is saying, you will find those who are most intense in their hostility towards the committed Muslims are Al-Yahud, those who have theologized their aggression against the Muslims, against the committed Muslims, and along with the Mushriks, those who have a functional a practical competition with Allah's power and authority in this world. So, and we thank Allah that he has given us this fair look at who they are. And we should not go to extremes. In the middle of this, this question is, is very good in that it addresses two mindsets or two psychologies that are at odds within we the Muslims. Some of us think, Oh, all of the Christians and all of the Jews are Ahl Kitab. And some of us think, no, all of the Christians and all of the Jews are Kafirs. These are extremes that we have to get rid of. And we have to take a Quranic look at reality and see how the Quran weeds out that context of people and shows us that there are good people among them, and there are bad people among them. And we should not lump the two together. We should be very conscious of this fact. That way, you know, they won't play diplomatic or propagandistic wars with us, giving us labels that we are at one time, you know, womanizers and camel jockeys and, 
you know. And then at the other time, we are these terrorist and bloodthirsty, uh, trigger happy killers uh, roaming the earth and all this. This is not who we are. This is who they, they want to project to the world that we are. But in fact, if we remain uh, defined and defining by this Quran, we will save ourselves the, the pitfalls that they are throwing us in. Jazakallah, Brother Muhammad. As a follow-up question to this, um, uh, a brother asked, uh, again referring to the Ahlul Kitab, he asked whether the Hindus and Buddhist scriptures can also be considered as uh, scriptures and uh, would they be considered as Ahlul Kitab? This area needs investigation. I've, I've asked myself that question many times and uh, the only answer I can give is and to be honest with you i don't know I, you know Im once imam malik was asked a question he simply said i don't know and that's the type of answer i would have to give you in all sincerity i don't know this needs further investigation was buddha a prophet from allah and then they his followers messed him up and presented him the way we understand him today was confucius also the same type of person was uh, Plato, Aflatoon in in Greece the same type of? We don't. This area needs. The world is begging us in in an indirect way, in a silent way. They're begging us to do our homework, to get down to the bottom of this and see whether they can be considered ahl kitab or not. It could go both ways. They could be and they couldn't be. I, I simply can't make a final statement on that. Uh, Jazakallah for that. I just want to add a comment to that. And that is that um, our friend in, in Saudi Arabia, Muhammad bin Salman, has added Ramayana and Mahabharat, these mythical stories of the Hindus, into the educational curriculum. While they are divesting Islamic education, removing Quranic verses from the from their curriculum, they are mm -hmm. adding these these things into their curriculum. <laughs> so I think we know which which direction they are heading. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's another question. Um, uh, this this brother asks or or sister, I don't know, but anyway, it, it was anonymous. He says, "What is Islam's angle on religious pluralism?" How and in what areas is Islam compatible with secular liberalism and in what areas it is not? Taking into account that uh, the reality that there are many Muslims that live in the secular Western societies today. Well, yeah, this is, uh, I wish we had more time to open up this file of uh, the secular world. But, you know, there's a way of, of giving an answer to that. To begin with, we Muslims know as a matter of reading the Qur'an and understanding it, uh, Allah says, La ikraha fi deen. You cannot, no one is allowed per Allah's guidelines and instructions to us to force anyone else into any type of belief, even if it is Islam itself. We know our Iman and our Islam uh, are the way of life. We are convinced. We are, convi we are uh, uh, very certain of this. But we can't force anyone. No one can force anyone to become a Muslim. And all of this literature in the, that sticks around all around the place that Islam was uh, that ex Islam expanded because of the sword and because of, you know, wars and all of this. That's nonsense. That is, I'm not here trying to say that we did not uh, have unjust rulers in our history. We certainly did. But we can't mix Islamic history. We can't mix, uh, we can't confuse that with Islam itself. We have to make, we have to draw the line between the two. So, those people, let's say in our societies, um, in, we're living, I'm living in the United States, uh, you're in Canada, others are living in other parts of Europe and other parts of the secular world. If we're living in those societies, we have to understand that the majority of people in those societies, whichever one 
we are living in agree to a certain pattern of, uh, of life. Uh, of course, we disagree uh, with the immorality of that pattern. If a certain country legalizes prostitution, as an example, or legalizes gambling, as an example, we, we don't like that. Uh, we wish that would never happen. Uh, and it's our duty to try to, as best as possible, weed that out of that particular society. But it's going to take the public mood uh, to change and see the light when the public, the, 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 the majority of people in a particular society, they agree. They come to their senses. They agree and they say, wait a minute, we have vice and we have immorality spreading throughout all our societies. It is eroding our family life. Uh, there is abortion on demand. The divorce rates are skyrocketing. Things are getting out of control. What solution is there out there for all of this? We should see if any Muslim living in these types of societies should take it as a a duty of him or herself to try to explain that the way out of this mess and morass, the way out of it is to understand the guidance that has come to mankind from Allah. And if we can shift that public opinion, if we can shift it away from its materialism, part of it is materialistic, if we can shift it away from its atheism, because part of it is atheist, and if we can shift it away from its secularism, because part of it is secular, as part of it is agnostic also, all of these elements go into the formation of these societies. And it is our duty and responsibility to begin to communicate this guidance from Allah to these people who need it and who have been smothered with anti-Islamic disinformation. It's all over the place. And we have, we have not, we meaning the collectivity of Muslims in the world, we have not established for ourselves the least thing we can have established in this context, in the secular context, Muslims living therein, a think tank. Why can't we have a think tank? The bare minimum. Who can, a think tank in which qualified Muslims come together and they can address these types of issues in the language that is receptive by those who are listening or watching or tuning in. Uh, no, nothing. Uh, does Islam, uh, do Muslims who live in, uh, I think I understood that this is part of the questions. Do Muslims living in secular societies, do they, are they comfortable with multiple religions or, you know, secular laws and these types of things? Of course, as I said, uh, you, you know, we know that there's Allah's law that is above man's law. And we would love to see Allah's law become the center of life. But if, if I'm a person living uh, among, or if we as a Muslim, what's called minority, if we are, let's say, one million living in a population of, let's say, uh, 50 million, and those 50 million, they have their secular way and they have their own, you know, religious convictions it's our duty to show them the light uh, and not, you know, because here in, here in the United States, let me be upfront about this. Here in the United States, there's a word that has been coined about, I don't know, at first I heard about it maybe about 15 years ago or so. It's called Sharia law. And they, they make this out to be a boogeyman as if Muslims want to impose the Sharia upon non-Islamic societies. That is nonsense. The Muslims cannot impose Sharia upon their own selves. If anyone who reviews the history of the nascent Islamic society in Arabia, 
when it began, there were no laws. We began the first 13 years of constructing our Islamic way of life without any laws. So how, and we were, <clears throat> we were a growing reality. But there comes a time when we become the majority. We're no longer very few in society. We ourselves and this is happening. I mean, I think some of these alarmist voices, they sense that Islam is the wave of the future. Muslims have a higher birth rate. There are many people who are, quote unquote, converting to Islam. There is a movement of Muslims from their uh, homelands, their original countries to countries that are predominantly non-Muslim. So these factors, when they combine, uh, there's uh, some individuals who, you know, everyone has their own chemistry, but they uh, look at this and they think that this is a threat to them. No, no such thing. We're not a threat to anyone. <laughs> it's the other way around. It seems like everyone's a threat to us. We, we are on the receiving things of everything whether it's the coining of words or whether it's the dropping of bombs, we are on the receiving uh, uh, end of all of this. And so you, you feel threatened by a person who, or by uh, a community who has uh, really nothing uh, that is threatening. We have our own ideas. We have our own, let's say, ideology, Islamic ideology. We have our own eschatology we have our own if you may philosophy and okay there's nothing to be afraid of we can discuss these matters but they don't they don't even offer muslims an open forum has anyone seen an open forum in these secular remember these are secular societies that are supposed to be so liberal as to listen to the different points of view well, where are we? Does anyone does anyone uh, want us to appear in public and speak our Islamic heart and mind about these issues? Uh, so, and uh, you know, as far as accommodating and coexisting with others, I think the Muslims, their history and their geography has more to say than my words. Which society in the world? If we look at the Muslims as one global community, which global community has the features that we have in the sense that we are neighbors to all of the religions of the world? Which, which of in, in mass, which other faith block of people in the world can say historically, contemporarily, and geographically that they are? Uh, next door neighbors to all faith groups of the world. So, uh, as as I said, you know, our our condition speaks for itself. We are weak. We are oppressed. It's nothing wrong with stating the facts, uh, but that's this is not a perpetual state of affairs. This is a a, a phase, and it will become history. Uh, in the coming uh, generation or two, and we will resume uh, our Islamic way of life, and hopefully we'll become a good model and a good example for the rest of the communities and societies in the world. The Prophet of Allah, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his, he had the first interfaith, as it's called in today's language, it wasn't called such back then, but he had the first interfaith uh, meeting in the world when the Christian delegation of Najran came to him in El Medina. He showed, they showed him respect. He showed them respect. They discussed. They spoke. But then they came to the very sensitive theological issue of whether Jesus is the begotten son of God. I'm using their language. So... When we came to that, when it came to that issue, we, the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, he challenged them to what is called al mubahala and that is evoking Allah's um, 
censorship or condemnation through prayer. We will offer our prayers, our joint prayers, and ask Allah to condemn whoever of us is not saying the truth. That's, uh, that's fair enough, isn't it? But at that point, they apologized and they said no. I mean, they had their little conclave. They met among themselves. The, uh, they were, these were high-ranking Christian clergymen. They said, no, we uh, exclude ourselves from that. And it ended that way. But there was no bad feelings. There was no hostility. There was nothing. Uh, uh, so, I mean, we're not as open as to uh, become... Uh, slaves, we are not as open as to become occupied or colonized. We're not, that, 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 that has no meaning here. No, we are open if you know minds and hearts are meeting. We are open. We will open our minds and our hearts if you open your minds and your hearts. But we're not open for you to throw in your militaries and rob our resources and place. Uh, uh, dummy rulers that take orders from you and dislocate Allah's power and authority. No, no, we're not open to that. There's no meaning to open this here. Uh, Brother Muhammad, we have a lot of questions, but I'm afraid we are coming close to the end of our time. And so I'm going to just pose one more question uh, and perhaps, you know, you can address it uh, briefly. And then we would conclude and perhaps we can think about doing um, future webinars to address other issues. You know, when the Quran was re revealed, there were no such terms as imperialist or colonialist or Zionist, etc. Yet you have included such terms in your translation and the tafsir. I mean, in other languages, of course, uh, scholars have had to invent new words. How is it possible for the Quranic Arabic to be such a set to have such a transcendental range to be inclusive of these concepts well you see yeah that you're right in the when the quran was revealed the word imperialist and the word zionist as we understand these words today did not exist at that time what existed at that time was uh what you may call political Judaism or political Christianity. There was a strain in the Jewish context that interpreted its understanding of scripture to include what we call in today's world politics or uh, the arrangement of human affairs at the state level. The same thing applies in the Christian context. So that the the, ide the religious, ideological, political component of Judaism has always been there. The religious, ideological uh, component, uh, political component of Christianity has always been there. Now, there are within these two contexts, the Jewish and the Christian context, there are Jews and there are Christians. Like I said, we have to be fair to this subject. Don't let anyone draw a general conclusion from this. Within the Jewish context, there are Jews who are opposed to the, the Zionists as they act out their political, ideological understanding of Judaism in the nation state called Israel. There are those who are opposed to that. They are, they are not a majority, but we still have to be fair to the issue and say that they do exist. And maybe, you know, to work for the future when eventually this Zionist apartheid ruling, oppressive, colonizing system ceases to exist, there should be steps right now to try to understand the extent uh, that we can build a common future with those who are opposed to Zionism as we are opposed to Zionism. The same thing applies on the other side. There are uh, Christians who have taken a Christian uh, understanding of the Bible 
and or the gospel, mostly the Bible, and they uh, rationalize and try to market their policies uh, with a religious explanation to it. You'll find this in a broad segment of those who call themselves evangelicals. And uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have Christians who are opposed to imperialism. In, in the past century, it was called colonialism. When the French and the British were leading this charge around the world, uh, claiming a white man's burden here. And um, uh, so we have to be fair here and acknowledge that among Christians, there are anti-imperialist Christians. And to, to work for a better future, we should begin to maybe build uh, a, a bridge or an understanding with these types so that we can uh, avoid uh, bloodshed and warfare in the future. And there are a lot of people in the militaries, people in the high offices of government, people in uh, certain think tanks and uh, people in religious institutions even who are closing ranks among themselves and they want the Muslims to go to war with every society on earth. And it's only this Qur'an, the understanding of this Qur'an accurately, as accurately as we can, that we can, we can see through this, this maze of those who say that they are Jews and those who say that they are Christians. And in this context, in the Jewish context, they secrete something called Zionism, which is um, a lethal uh, destructive and expansionist type of warfare and corresponding to that there's the imperialists on the other side within the Christian context so if if these words Zionist and imperialist did not exist at the time of the revelation of this Quran the meanings of the of certain ayat in the Quran will focus our attention, if we understand these ayat, will focus our attention on what these types of people call themselves today. And they, on the Zion, we didn't give the Zionists a name, they gave it to themselves. We didn't give the imperialists a name, they gave it to themselves. But we have enough information in this guideline and this guidance and this guidebook, the Quran from Allah, to identify them and not sweep them under. So, oh, the, the Zionists, oh, these are just like today, the main policies out of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and all of this. They were, for, In the news a few weeks ago, we heard that the first rabbi was approved to be located in, the, in Saudi Arabia. There's a rabbi, a Zionist rabbi. Now, they listen to this. As I said, there are anti-Zionists who are Jews. Okay, if these, if there was any good, if there's un, any insight in the rulers in the Arabian Peninsula, and you know there were uh, Jews in the Arabian Peninsula 1,400 years ago, we had no problems with Jews or Christians in the Arabian Peninsula. We do have problems with Zionists and imperialists in the Arabian Peninsula. So they, they want a Zionist rabbi to come. To, well, I don't know. They, they haven't, uh, the information that the last I heard, they haven't said exactly where he's going to settle. Is it going to be in Khaybar? They're going to rebuild Khaybar. Is it going to be in El Medina, where there were uh, three Jewish communities there? during the time of the prophet? Where's this, where's this Zionist rabbi going to be? And why did they pick a Zionist rabbi? Why couldn't they pick an anti-Zionist rabbi? And the same thing uh, 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 is applicable to evangelicals and those of, of the Christian faith. We, well, we Muhammad, have, I have to interrupt. We have uh, uh, 30 seconds for you to conclude, please. Okay. <laughs> well, I think on that note, uh, I, I think the message all in all, they got the gist, they got the feeling. 
of what the the type of communication that we are trying to uh, touch base with everyone out there who has an open mind and an open heart. That's all we're asking for. And may Allah reward us all for our efforts and accept our duties and our devotion to him, especially during this month of Ramadan. Amen. Amen. I'd like to thank you profoundly for uh, your uh, guiding us through uh, at least some of the issues pertaining to this translation. Uh, I, I've got a whole lot of other questions that obviously we couldn't go through and there are brothers and sisters that have been asking questions. But I'd like to thank you and all the technical team with you that have facilitated this. And in particular, Brother Afif, Brother Imran, Brother Harun, Brother Hassam, your entire family for their great sacrifices, Brother Maksud, and so many other brothers and sisters that have really put in a lot of effort into uh, facilitating this. Uh, I just want to remind uh, our viewers once again, uh, this uh, translation of the Quran, it's available. Alhamdulillah, it's already you know, come from the press, come out from the press in South Africa. It'll take a little while for us to get it in North America. But in the meantime, please uh, place your orders, pre-order them through ICITTafsir at gmail.com so that we can uh, proceed with the, with the processing of this. And we do need your support. Uh, may Allah bless you all. Uh, we hope and pray, inshallah, that we can meet again. We will check with you whether we need to have uh, another webinar regarding this. But for now, I, we hope that, inshallah, you have found it um, enlightening. And this would be, of course, uh, a link would be provided for those of our brothers and sisters that want to uh, uh, see it later on. May Allah bless you all. May Allah reward you in this very, very blessed month of Ramadan. We thank you for your participation. From me, Zafar Bangash, assalamu alaikum. The Ascendant Quran, an advanced English translation of the meanings of the Quran.